Bell Labs got its first actual laser printer in 1982, which I think was from a company called Imogen. Now in those days, yeah, you could get them, but the big problem, the big, big problem was fonts. It wasn't by any means impossible to get laser printer technology at lower resolution than the Omnitech was doing more reliable. In Nottingham, we asked for a price, I think, for a, an Imogen uh, early laser printer, and we were told it would be $18,000 in the UK, which would have translated to about £15,000. It's ridiculously expensive. If you're getting to lower resolutions, like 300 dots per inch, what then happens is that your eyes are sensitive enough to notice roughnesses on the edge of the character. In other words, the pixel density at 300 dpi is such that if something goes wrong in terms of the pattern of pixels and you get a fault at the edge of the character, your eyes notice it. At 972 dpi, they probably wouldn't notice at all. So the burning question was, how can we do this rounding problem, if you like? We've got these beautiful outlines, and we need to translate them into dot patterns. How do you work out which pixels to turn on, which to turn off? And if you've got half a pixel by the time you've done your calculations, do you turn it on or do you turn it off? And of course you can imagine what happens. It looks bad if you didn't turn that pixel on. It looks even worse if you did turn it on. You just couldn't win. It was a huge problem. Um, and within the industry, there was the most ferocious debate with, within Xerox, Canon, wherever. And uh, even many of you know the computer scientist who got involved around about this time with typesetting Don Knuth. And the consensus was that down at low resolution, you just had to have hand-tuned bitmap fonts with all the pixels put in place correctly. There was no shortcut. There was no way that you could, if you like, on the fly, scale down from outlines to dots on a drum and get it right automatically. Hand-tuning was the way forward. Well, if that was the case, it was a real mess because it meant that your laser printer had to be backed up with an expensive hard disk or cartridge system. And some commenters already on the jailbreak system who've used these have said what a nightmare it was. You had a very restricted range of fonts. They never seemed to work correctly. And that whole disk, instead of holding 50 or 60 different typefaces, was devoted to holding times Roman hand-tuned in about 40 usable point sizes, stuff like that. The thing that kept us going though, the rumours on the horizon if you like, were that two people working for Xerox Park called Warnock and Geschke were about to leave Xerox Park and form a new company called Adobe. Now the moment you say Xerox Park you start thinking, we need a complete new video just on that alone. PARC, P-A-R-C, Palo Alto Research Centre. If Bell Labs was the one place that everybody wanted to work at in the 1970s, then Xerox Park was certainly the other. And there was a similar background in some ways. Um, Bell Labs had lots and lots of money. Um, because of AT&T, but of course they were under con consistent scrutiny for, for, for monopolistic practices and don't you ever dare turn yourselves into a computer company. It wouldn't be allowed. Xerox probably didn't have quite as much money as Bell Labs, but nevertheless, even today, Xerox, I think, turns over about $20 billion a year. So they could afford a vanity project, and they did. The Xerox Palo Alto Research Center was run off the Xerox publicity budget. That's how much money Xerox were making, and probably still do make, out of just being a photocopier company. But at Xerox Park, they invented, either invented or had a very strong development role in all sorts of things that are now commonplace. The computer mouse, the laser printer, 
bit mapped terminals which we take for granted nowadays but if you skip back to my earlier video on from mainframes to unix just take a look at what the old character terminals used to be like sort of cells of dots about nine by nine with the characters in you certainly couldn't get down to the bit level on your screen but with bitmap terminals you could they had under development at xerox park things with names like alto and dorado bitmap terminals wonderful and they had bob metcalf there they were crucially involved in the development of ethernet they had it all they had all the necessary components to pioneer the next stage of computing if you like the workstation revolution but in a book i think called fumbling the future the author of that book makes the case that they fumbled it, they let it all fall, they didn't market it and they could have done. Well, to be fair to Xerox at the time, you could argue they made the right decision. Turning yourself into a computer company is hard to do if you're not a computer company already. And wonderful though their technology was, it was reckoned at the time that the cost of the components alone in mid-1970s money to make an Alto terminal the components alone would have cost $10,000. If they were mad enough to go into marketing the thing, they would have had to charge at least $25,000 in 1975 money. Probably about $250,000 in today's money. So you could say, in a sense, they had to wait for the cost of the technology to come down. And they had to accept that all these toys were very, very expensive indeed. Now, the only problem was, with sitting and developing all this wonderful technology, was that the hotshot computer scientists you'd got working for you got very frustrated that their wonderful inventions and developments were not being marketed. And so gradually, as the 70s wore on into the 80s, people began to leave and form their own startups. Chuck Geschke, John Warnock, both considerable computer scientists in their own right, were working on Xerox's Interpress language and just got so frustrated with Xerox's inability, a lack of will to market this properly that they up sticks and left and formed Adobe, which you've all heard of, in late 1982. I think they initially decided that they were going to go for the high-end typesetting market. Soon after they left and founded Adobe, John Warnock got to work on a language that's achieved great fame ever since called PostScript. I think it very carefully avoided the precise way that Interpress had done things and it reverted back to lots of John's earlier work because he was a computer graphics specialist who came out of the University of Utah had also worked for the graphics company called Evans & Sutherland and in his PhD had solved the infamous hidden surface problem which had defied efficient solution for quite some time. Um, I think I've already told you in the video I did about David Huffman and Huffman trees his PhD thesis was 12 pages I think. John told me that his uh, PhD thesis about solving the hidden surface problem was a little bit bigger all of 32 pages. So here was this computer scientist, but a computer graphics expert, joined up with another considerable computer scientist, Chuck Geschke. It was the ideal combination to found this new company. John came up with this language called PostScript, which was going to be a tour de force of two-dimensional graphics, and it was. And more to the point, he was going to get to grips with solving this problem of how to make fonts look good at low resolutions. You want to hold the outline of the font as arcs, splines, lines, whatever, for as long as possible. But in the end, it has got to get down to being pixels. It's got to be dots on a laser printed drum. And in fact, there's some other stuff, of course. John Chapman's uh, videos on computer files, so relevant to this. You really ought to watch them. So here's some more detail which relates to that. Oh, by the way, thanks to Fontographer. Those of you who want to know how I did the uh, so-called printout font in the jailbreak video, I think the papers that we web link to make this clear. But anyway, I use Fontographer. And within the Fontographer manual, there is a very useful pair of pages which makes very clear this difficulty with getting characters to look good on a coarse resolution. Consider a letter H. Here's the outline superimposed on top of a grid of pixels. Now, 
How do you decide which pixels of these vertical stems to be coloured in? If you follow the argument that a pixel should be made black only if it's totally within the outline, then if your outline isn't quite as helpfully aligned with the pixels as it might be, this is what you end up with. On the left hand side, the only ones that are totally within the outline is a single column. Whereas on this side, there's two columns. If you back off, take away the grid of pixels at the back and look at what the character looks like, it's awful. You know, you've got uneven stem widths. And do notice in these, of course, the crossbar's gone on the H. Isn't that wonderful? Of course it would go. It's so thin in that, in that design, it's been rounded down and it's vanished completely. Here's another thing, even if you could solve that, these flicky bits, as we know, are the tops and bottoms of characters. I think probably everybody knows they're called serifs. Well, you need your serifs to look good as well. And if you're not careful, you can end up with the stems getting better and more equal, but the serifs having no symmetry whatsoever, even though they're supposed to be the same shape, the precise way they align with the grid underneath is such that they don't look symmetrical anymore whereas they were in the first instance. And then you can say, oh, could we solve all of this by saying, well, tell you what, we'll turn the pixel on if any part of it touches the outline. However, glancing, if you like, the impact is between the pixels and the outline. If it's at all remotely touching, turn it on. And that's the kind of mess you end up with if you do that. So what you needed was a system of what came to be known as hints. Well, on the diagrams here, for the letter M, hints show all the places in which the Adobe Type 1 font system actually said mattered. Hints about the serifs, these are important, take care. Hints about horizontal lines, like on the H, don't round it down and don't have it disappear altogether. Within the font mechanism, it was basically when you were scaling down the outline and as John Chapman's videos will also show you in the end although you can delay doing a straight line approximation to curves in the end that's what you do you end up with triangles and polygons okay and then those triangles and polygons you work out where they intersect with the underlying pixels and so on so late on in the process, and this is the advantage of this more modern approach compared to the 202, rather faster processors, you can leave the, uh, as it were, translation into straight line approximations and pixels until the latest possible moment, thereby giving yourself flexibility. Now this shows you, this is liner type 202 resolution up at the top. That is the base, I think, of a stem of a letter H or I or something like that. At, something more like 970 dots the inch, and you can see there's no problem. If you back off from that, your eyes are probably not sensitive enough to notice the odd pixel that's gone astray. But down at 300 dpi, they certainly will. And of course, the problem manifests itself hugely at 300 dpi if you have small point sizes, like 6 point or 8 point. You end up, if you're not careful, with everything looking just like a full stop because there's been so many errors. So this is why you need these hints. You need stem hints, you need serif hints, you need hints to uh, stop horizontal things vanishing altogether due to rounding down. John Warnock was the recipient of a very prestigious medal called the Loveless Medal. And my friend Conrad Taylor has done a report on that uh, talk, which um, he's happy for us to uh, use. And in Conrad's report, you will see that John Warnock actually admitted 20 years after the event that there was another dirty trick that they did as well as if you like, as part of the hints that they didn't let on about. If you look back at this diagram here and how it translates to turned on pixels here, although it will enrage the type designers, there is a way that you can help yourself here. Type designers like calling the gap to the left of a character the left side bearing and the gap at the right of the character the right side bearing. Now, if you look carefully, the left side bearing here is ever so slightly wider than the right side bearing. This is part of the design. You position your 
character within the cell so that it looks right in all combinations with all other characters and even in a fixed width font like printout of the previous video you found the left and right side bearings are still not equal yeah but what john and his merry men did in their type one renderer was to say actually although the designer will kill us they probably won't notice if at the very last minute we just shove the letter H ever so slightly further left. Okay? So that instead of ending up with a one pixel line and a two pixel line, you might end up with both of them being one and a half because you've made the alignment of the character against the background grid be just much more sympathetic. And if it's one and a half, it doesn't matter whether you round them both sides to one or round them up to two. They are at least going to be equal. Okay? That's going to help a lot. So he actually admitted in 2004 that it was not beyond them to ever so subtly shift the character within its unit cell to get a better alignment and a better result. So that is then pretty well a summary of what had to be done, what had to be got right with hinting before, if you like, quality font stood any hope of working properly with laser printers. John Warnock put the postscript language effectively into the public domain and said, go on, implement it. I want it to be a standard. You know, implementation is the sincerest form of flattery, as one of the first implementers said. But the story was this, you can use all the graphics operators in PostScript, you could do a pretty acceptable font that way. But it was what Adobe called at the time a Type 3 font. It did not have these hints to enable you to survive and make it look good down at very small point sizes on low resolution devices. If you wanted that, then back in 1980, from about 1985 to 1989, you had to sign a contract with Adobe to license their hinting technology. And this was secret. This was one of the ways that Adobe, as a young company, wanted to make money. They were selling postscript implementations, of course, to other printer manufacturers, but there was a nice font revenue stream from licensing people to put Type 1 hints onto Adobe Type 1 fonts. So there we are then. There's another story to come here, but we'll get on to that later about how Adobe survived with that model for about four or five years, but eventually Gates and Jobs were not going to pay endless royalties for Type 1 to John Warnock, dearly though they loved him, and we could do a talk at some stage about the emergence of true type out of that. But for the moment, here's the story then. You needed a laser printer equipped with PostScript, but with PostScript plus the ability to cope with Type 1 fonts. And do be clear, this hinting information, things like these stems should be of the same width, that crossbar on the H, don't round it down and don't lose it. This is used at the very last moment when you're converting things into pixels on the imaging drum. And it's ultra, ultra important that you get it right. But effectively, John and his merry men with PostScript had, and the hinting, had solved a problem which many people in the industry said was insoluble, you know? There isn't a way to take outlines and round them down to all point sizes and make it look good. Well, you might say that some of the tricks that John did were compromises and were fell a little bit short of perfection. But frankly, even to type professionals, I don't know if you did an A and B, you know, hand-tuned bitmap H versus what the Adobe Type 1 mechanism did with that H. Okay, with a good microscope, you'd notice the difference. But for everyday use, no problem at all. It, the problem was solved, essentially. I've got hold of here a reproduction of our party piece that we used to do for people on the 202. Can you imagine that in beautiful, fresh, gleaming bromide? The next thing you do, this is great fun, is to decorate the tree. I now want to, from this, work out what the correct code, the minimal code, should be for a given state. 